Hi, this is Barry and welcome to another episode of Simplicity Zen. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you could take a moment and hit like and um, subscribe if you haven't already done so. And, um, also, comments help. Um, and the reason I ask is that these metrics help um, YouTube share the videos to more people. And it's always fun to have more people be aware of this podcast if possible. If you're listening on the podcast apps, you could go to the website simplicityzen.com and see other interviews I've done. Um, we're you know well over 50 at this point, and you can also sign up for the um, for the newsletter, which I promise someday I'll start sending out. Actually, I'll start this week. And then um, you can also, if you want to reach out to me and discuss any of the podcasts, my um, there's a link there for my email address. You could do that there. Um, so today my guest is Neil Schmeitzer Torbett. Did I pronounce that right? Oh, Schmitzer Torbert, but still it's a yeah, Torbert. Torbert. Uh, Neil is a professor of psychology at Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana, where he teaches courses and conducts research on memory and learning. Yeah, he's a psychology professor there, of course. Uh, he's a um, he's also a Zen practitioner and runs a website called the Neural Buddhists, which explores the intersection between Zen and neuroscience. And um, anyone who knows me in real life knows that, you know, my great passion is kind of is exactly that the intersection between Zen and neuroscience, you know, Buddhism in general. And so um, and the reason I how I found out about Neil was um, there's this book called Anil Seth. I mean, sorry, there's a, a scientist called Anil Seth, and he wrote a book called um, Being You, I think it's called. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and I type and I, and I so I Googled um, Anil Seth buddhism or something like that because i was because I was, I was curious of what you know other people's thoughts were, or of his, of annals seth's work you know from the context of buddhism and um and your website popped up so that's how i discovered you and you know went through your um your articles i thought like oh he'd be a fun guy to interview and, oh, and thank uh, you. yeah and, th and graciously you agreed to do it um so you're you're on uh, winter break right now right Yes, yeah, our students are going to be coming back to start their classes in the 17th, but um, students who are seniors will be taking a set of comprehensive exams uh, mm -hmm. this week. So yeah, this is probably the day when the activity really starts to ramp up on campus, uh, which is it's nice to see it kind of coming back out of um, oh. hibernation. And uh, does your school have graduate degrees or is it a four year university? What's the structure? No, there? we're, yeah, a very much a private, uh, small liberal arts college. Uh, we only award uh, Bachelor of Arts degrees and, you know, no graduate programs. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of an odd um, school today in that we are one of the, the few remaining single sex institutions that are all male. Um, so, oh, all the student body, we only admit male students. Um, uh -huh. So, which makes us, yes, very, uh, very rare today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people can be comfortably geeky without worrying about how it looks. Well, I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it, it's a, it's an environment that I, I, I think I've really appreciated the sense of community that just comes mm -hmm. from being at a small institution. Mm -hmm. um, I think of the all male nature of the student body as, as not like a critical part of that, but certainly being in a small town in the Midwest, uh, having an all male student body, certainly does kind of constrain the size of the institution. So I think that it is it is part of the mix of what makes the place uh, special. Um, cool. But, you know, having gone to all co-ed institutions, you know, it wasn't a factor that, you know, was something that, you know, like for many of our students, they don't come here because it's single sex, but, you know, because they find a community that they, um, that they feel um, that they can engage with and uh, feel comfortable with. Cool. So I, I noticed you have your name on some semi-recent research papers. Um, do you guys, do you guys, are any of your students working? I mean, who is this collaboration you're doing outside of the institution, or is this happening within the context of the four-year program? So it's a little bit of both. So we are a teaching-focused college, and so I'll teach three classes this uh, semester, maybe four, depending on how you count it. Uh, three full classes. Um, and then during the semester, I'll do a little bit of research with students who are finishing their senior capstone projects. Mm -hmm. But really, the bulk of the work that I do happens in the summer, often working with uh, students over eight-week internships. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then also in collaboration with colleagues at other institutions. So I, I found it to be most, um, it, it works best for me to be able to work on a project where we don't have to have the whole research team here uh, mm -hmm. because students typically, they may work with a faculty member for a project for you know one to maybe three years, mm -hmm. but you don't have the time to really develop as much of a kind of the inertia or the deep expertise that you might get if you had graduate students and postdocs. Um, so yeah, I've been collaborating over the years with my former, my graduate advisor, Dave Reddish at uh, University of Minnesota and some other colleagues there uh, and Veronique Bobat at McGill University, um, really kind of following up questions that I've been interested in since graduate school, but shifting more to from animal models to studying humans using usually computer tasks that try to create you know, human versions of the experiments we've conducted in generally rats and, and mice. Uh, when you're doing the human studies, are these fMRI studies or, or are they not, more results oriented? So yeah. not here, yeah, mostly behavioral and cognitive. So we've done a few pilot studies where, you know, maybe a colleague at Minnesota or McGill will conduct the fMRI component. Mm -hmm. um, really a long time ago now, back in 2013, I think somewhere, 13 or 14, that was a little after that. But mm -hmm. I took a small group of students to McGill to visit Dr. Bobot's lab. And uh, we did an imaging study of the students as they were participating in a, a study of navigation, trying to look at the impact of using a GPS on your navigation. Um, well, not just your navigation abilities, but also um, brain areas that are critical for spatial localization, like the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a profitable direction, but that type of work is just expensive enough that without grant funding, it just didn't seem to be uh, a direction that I could really push here. Mm -hmm. I think that coming out of the pandemic, you know, we might look for closer collaborations to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, most of the things we do here are studying uh, people performing tasks that we're mainly making behavioral measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, if they're tested in person here in the lab, we might do eye tracking measurements to get kind of a richer sense of uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the work we've done over the past few years has been uh, recruiting people online, mainly so we can get a more diverse uh, participant mm -hmm. sample. Because, you know, here we're not only limited to college age students who are all male, but many of whom come from Indiana neighboring states. And so to get a more diverse group, we really kind of have to go uh, to some other participant pool. So, yeah, a lot of our work has been collecting data online. Isn't that an, an issue with um, a lot of university based research that the oftentimes the subjects of the st psychological studies are young white college students and there's some question of you know is that how representative is that of human experience in general you... it, it has been a concern and and i think that what we really try to focus on with our students is to try to to think like every study has to balance what we would call the external validity to what degree do our research findings apply to people in general but also to real world situations mm -hmm. and then balancing that against internal validity to what degree have we established a strong causal uh, relationship that we can say that you know one factor you know produces an effect? So you know, most of the techniques we have are going to are going to be limited in maximizing or to either try to maximize internal or external validity. And so we really try to emphasize that you need a range of studies um, for some questions. You know, having college age students that a relatively homogeneous group is not really a huge problem. So a lot of studies of kind of basic sensory processes have, have really uh, given us a lot of important insights that do generalize well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we should always be cautious about um, drawing conclusions from a limited number of, of studies and especially those that haven't studied uh, a large representative group of people and in a variety of situations. So yeah, no, that's that's always a concern. But we feel it, especially at a small college, we feel it very acutely. Mm -hmm. So um, I definitely want to get back to more back to your research, but let's uh, transition yeah. a little bit to your to your biography, so to speak. So um, I'd be curious, you know, where you grew up and, and we can kind of march on from there and was kind of some emphasis on what what 
part of your biography kind of led you towards both, you know, kind of science and Zen. So, uh, you know, where did you grow up? So, yeah, so I grew up in uh, rural Illinois. Um, if anyone is familiar with the Peoria, Quad Cities, Kiwani area, so kind of central western um, Illinois uh, in a very rural uh, area. I would refer to it as the, the town of Nakoma, but my wife, when she visited uh, back when we were dating in college, she's like, no, this isn't a town. <laughs> it's not even a village. It was just a collection of houses out in the country, um, really just in the middle of the farmland. And um, we, you know, went, I went to my brother and I, when we were young, went to a very small school and later my uh, sister uh, in a neighboring town of about a 2,000, 2,400 uh, people. So yeah, very small uh, community and uh, growing up, I don't know where my interest in science really had started, uh, but you know, uh, for my interest in Zen, I think partly it came from the fact that growing up uh, while my grandparents were, were I think very religious, um, my parents weren't really involved formally or at least not consistently in a church. Um, so while we went to Sunday school, uh, some at my grandmother's and grandfather's church, you know, we really didn't get in the habit of attending regularly. And so I kind of grew up without a strong uh, sense. Oh, maybe we lost Barry. Hi, so I'm I'm back. So if if someone watching this is kind of jerky here, what happens? My um, internet service went out, and so I've reconnected using tethering on my phone. So um, apologize in advance if there's any weird transitions here. So you, you were talking about how you, you you didn't grow up with any particular religious background or anything like that. Well, I grew up in the, yeah in families that you know were coming from a Christian background, but without a lot of um, like religious education and without like a strong connection to kind of Christian traditions. Uh, my wife, uh, you know, she'll tell a story that when we visited my uh, paternal grandparents, you know, after we left the their home, she had said to me, well, you never told me that your grandparents were Catholic. And like, I don't think they're Catholic. And she's like, no, I think they are. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is in college. And I was like, well, I mean, what makes you think that? And she's like, well, you know, there's a statue of the Virgin Mary and there's like a palm frond on it and, you know, various things around the house. And so, you know, I asked my, I called my dad, uh, I think that day or the next day and asked, and, he's, and he just laughed. And he's like, yeah, of course, your grandparents are Catholic, but, you know, the, none of the, my aunts and uncles were devoutly Catholic. You know, it didn't really show up in our lives you know, when I was around and, and perhaps I wasn't the most observant child, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's, I really didn't have a strong connection to any particular spiritual tradition. And so I think that some of the factors that really were important for me were that in high school, my freshman year, uh, I learned about a residential public math and science academy, uh, the Illinois math and science academy that's in Aurora, uh, suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I found appealing. And so I applied and I was able, I was accepted and uh, went to an environment that was very focused on uh, science and mathematics, trying to develop, I think, um, students who would go on to hopefully contribute to the skill, the labor force in Illinois. But um, even though we've settled one state over, hopefully they feel like that was a valuable investment. And yeah. so I think that was really important in getting me interested in science. And I uh -huh. left high school uh, planning to become an electrical engineer, although I changed course once I got to college. Um, but then also while I was in uh, at at IMSA, I guess, and again, I, I may be misremembering some of the steps, but the way I recall, or what from what I recall, I had a roommate who had a copy of uh, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones that I don't think he was a Zen practitioner at the time, but had studied martial arts and had a number of interesting books. And I think that was my first exposure. And uh, from there, I think- what, what did you think of it? 
I think that at the time, I I found it very appealing uh, as a relatively self-conscious and uncertain teenager that some of the, the vignettes or stories included were very appealing in presenting a model of a person who seemed comfortable and able to deal with um, social challenges easily. And so I, I found it very appealing in that like, oh, so again, naively at that time, what was attractive was like, you know, is that a way like a person like myself could live, right? Mm -hmm. That, and so that sparked some interest. And I think from there, then I just started reading more widely. Um, and again, and I just still in high school, right? Yeah. So I think I started reading more widely. And if I, if I recalled correctly, it would be things like the three pillars of Zen, Zen mind, beginner's mind. And somewhere relatively early, I came across uh, Charlotte Joko Beck's books, um, or at least one of them, I think in high school. And, and that, that was pretty, info or pretty influential, you know, in kind of uh, nurturing an interest in Zen. Mm -hmm. But um, I really just was a, I just practiced on my own uh, from study of books that I could find. So you started and, sitting. Yes. Yeah. But mainly just using, you know, books as my main guide. I didn't have any contact with, um, like a community until I started graduate school. Um, again, mainly being a relatively self-conscious and, and socially anxious child or teenager. Uh, it, I think I visited, I think in college. So sometime before 96, I think I visited the, is it Prairie Winds Zen Center in uh, Champaign, Illinois? I think there's a one of uh, Joko Beck's um, Dharma era oh, uh, teaching there. Yeah, get, um, Ellie, get, yes. get, what's his name? Um, Genjo. Yes. No. Yeah. Gen, Gen, Genro, Genro or something, Genro. So I visited their community what? once, yeah. and but it was just far enough that also transportation, like not having access to uh, reliable transportation. It just wasn't really feasible to really connect. Mm -hmm. um, I could have when I was in Aurora, but getting into Chicago was was a challenge as a high school student. So it wasn't until I started graduate school in neuroscience that I also connected to a, a Zen community. So, so did you um, <clears throat> did you do any martial arts or anything as a child? No, it was one of those things, again, I think for <coughs> that age, it was something I was interested in, but, you know, we just, at the time, we didn't have the means or access, and so it it sounded like a great idea, something I would be interested in, but it seemed like an unrealistic fantasy uh, for, and maybe it wasn't, maybe I was overly pessimistic, but it, it seemed inaccessible. Um, because of your location. Yeah, yeah. Growing up in a small community and just, you know, having not having a lot of <clears throat> the financial um, resources, like, yeah, it, it seemed like the the financial funding I had available, like that would be, not be a good use of those funds at the time. Mm -hmm. So what, um, <clears throat> so you had a general interest in, in engineering and science. Yeah. From your high school. What um, you, you said you switched your major in uh, in undergraduate. What what was the catalyst of switching that major? So honestly, a lot of it was random. So I had a, a um, my academic advisor. A lot of small colleges don't have a separate academic advisor. It's actually a faculty member who kind of guides you through the course selection process. So I had a academic advisor, uh, Lance Factor, who uh, was a uh, really a very important mentor for me when I was in college. And, you know, looking at my record as a high school student, he felt like I could handle the academic challenge. And so when we were signing up for classes, I wasn't able to get into the calculus class that would have been appropriate because it was closed. And so he encouraged me to take biological psychology, even though I'd never had a psychology course before, just believing that I could handle it. And uh, it was a terrifying experience, but I trusted his judgment. Uh, the very first day, um, our professor, Heather Hoffman, uh, who's another dear mentor and friend, um, you know, started off by the class by dividing us up and asking us, you know, in the fall of 96 to come up with our favorite neurotransmitter as small groups. And so we divided up and I turned to my group members and I said, what is a neurotransmitter? <laughs> and then from that kind of inauspicious start, it was still a, a really wonderful kind of introduction to 
like looking at the biological basis of behavior and cognition. Um, and yeah, so that was part of the, the switch. Although for a while I thought I wanted to do clinical psychology and only came around to neuroscience after doing a summer internship after my sophomore year. Uh, I had funding through a program, the McNair Scholars Program that helps um, underrepresented groups. So students of color, um, women, low income and first generation college students get access to uh, information about graduate education to try to, to encourage them to consider careers in academia. And so as a low income first generation college student, I qualified and had funding to support a summer internship. And I wrote to um, John Kabat-Zinn's Center for Mindfulness to see if they could just take an intern who didn't need any funding and was able to spend, I think, eight or 10 weeks in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, analyzing some data that they had and kind of interacting with their staff. And so um, I, I kind of took some interests that were developing around kind of combining science and uh, my interest in meditation practice and trying to look at how to do an empirical project. And while I was out in uh, at the out at the Center for Mindfulness, the way I recall it is one of the teachers there, I think that their spouse was a publisher. And the book, I don't know if you'd ever seen the book Zen and the Brain that mm -hmm. came out kind of in. Yeah. yeah. So I think at that time, it, I don't know if it was just out or if it was coming out, but they had a set of page proofs. And so I was able to read through this book, you know, a chunk of it while we were there. And I just found the idea captivating that you could start to think about these kind of meditation experiences, like very subjective experiences from kind of a mechanistic approach. Mm. Um, so I don't really use that <coughs> book directly, but it was kind of critical and kind of stimulating my interest in, in neuroscience to say, ah, yeah, I'm interested in like, what's the physical basis of memory of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I went back and I uh, talked to uh, Professor Hoffman, uh, who had become my advisor by then, or no, actually, no, it was Tim Castor's my advisor, but she was a mentor in neuroscience. And, and I asked her, okay, if I want to do graduate school in neuroscience, what do I have to do? Because we didn't have a program. And she just gave me a list of what today we might call a minor in cell biology. And so as a junior, you know, she just gave me that list. And, and I just started checking off classes to prepare for uh, grad school in neuroscience. That's cool. So when you were at, um, <clears throat> sorry, when you were at John Cabot Zen's um, center, there was there was there any meditation? Did you work? no? Occasionally they would go around. Like it was, I think, up to the staff members. There wasn't a regularly scheduled time, but you could go around, and they had a, a set of chimes that it probably was a singing bowl. But I thought. Or in my mind, it reminds me of like a set of like more what we think of as Tibetan chimes, but basically there would be a call and if people wanted, you could gather to sit. I don't think that happened really regularly when in the time I was there. So I think uh, Kabat-Zinn was in Germany at the time, and then he returned kind of partway through my time there. Uh, <coughs> I did, they did allow me to participate in their uh, MBSR course as a participant. So to go through it with some other um, individuals who were taking it, you know, as patients or people who were interested. And so that, that would have been your first formal meditation instruction then. Probably. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And then um, uh, they had a staff retreat at one of the, the members, one of the staff members um, homes out in the woods, uh, which was, yeah, just a really nice experience. They kind of gave still a kind of a sense of how their organization ran. And, and again, yeah, that was a very formative experience in, uh, for me and in, in encouraging me to seek out kind of more formal groups that to join some kind of community. And so uh, that waited until graduate school, but, you know, it helps kind of solidify my motivation. Where, uh, where'd you go to graduate school? So the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. So we, uh, I had applied all over and we considered uh, my uh, fiance at the time and now wife, like where we wanted to live. And she had family in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then also living in Minneapolis at the time. And I visited and really enjoyed their program, uh, found it very exciting and just a good fit with my own personality. 
So mm -hmm. we ended up yeah locating there in 2000 in the summer. Was this for a master's program or a doctorate? Now, at that time, they did not have a master's option. So yeah, there's a lot of variety in graduate programs, uh, especially in neuroscience, that um, the PhD is kind of the default. I think in my time there, they gave out one master's degree to someone who had progressed a, a considerable distance, but decided they didn't really want to finish. And I think that they formalized a path to a terminal master's uh, but the default, at least when I was there, is that you're signing up for the PhD or the MD PhD, the combined medical degree. And did you finish that there? Yeah, that was, yeah. So we were there between 2000 and then wrapped up just at the end of 2004. I started my first teaching job in January of 2005. Mm -hmm. so what was your research focus? So yeah, at uh, at Minnesota, I was just very fortunate to be able to work with uh, uh, David Reddish, who was just starting a new lab. His background was, as a PhD student, was in uh, uh, computer science and doing computational models of uh, areas like the hippocampus and also the systems that help track uh, head direction, uh, so to help an animal or human recall or estimate what direction they're facing in an environment. Um, he had done his postdoc work uh, with Kara Barnes in Arizona, looking at how neurons in the hippocampus especially encode information about, you know, where an animal is in the environment. And so he was starting up a lab where he was combining this um, empirical approach of doing experiments, mostly in rats at the time, with a, a computational approach to try to build kind of more accurate models for like how, how is the brain actually processing information? So when I arrived, that was uh, when uh, Dave was just starting his lab and I was able to kind of join along with another grad student that year. And yeah, found that to be a really creative um, environment. Is that what your thesis ended up being? Yeah, so we were focused on learning and memory and interested in like how, like how the brain encodes information related to habits. And mm -hmm. so we were studying the main task that I focused on was one where rats learn to find their way through what we call the multiple T maze, where it's basically a set of T shaped uh, structures placed kind of end to end. So imagine the rat comes up the first T, makes a left turn. If that turn is correct, they'll find the start of the next T. If they go to the right, they'll find a dead end, they turn around. And so they make a set of left right decisions. And at the end, they have to commit to going left or right to find food that's delivered from uh, two pellet dispensers. Mm -hmm. And so what we found is that not surprisingly, rats can learn that task relatively well and they could run that task every day, you know, finishing 60 to more than hundred uh, journeys through the maze. But what was nice is once they learned the general task structure, then every day we could switch the order of the turn. So to give them a new sequence, so they learn something general, but then every day they might have to learn something specific, like what's the sequence that you're going to experience today. Mm -hmm. And we were focusing on how do neurons in the brain in part, uh, in a part we would call, or part of the basal ganglia, and the humans that uh, it would be the caudate and the putamen together, those are often called the dorsal stridum. And so we were recording from uh, neurons that are in the dorsal stridum as rats were doing this task and looking at, well, how do these neurons respond? And we saw a lot of responses like as rats were moving through the T maze or when they received reward. And um, that helped us kind of get a sense of, well, how do these neurons encode information? How does that shift like as they develop a more uh, automatic, maybe what we something closer to a habit for how to move through that sequence of turns? So would you would you characterize this as operant conditioning or classical conditioning? So it would be it would involve mostly what we consider operant conditioning. Mm -hmm. But the one of the challenges when you jump into operant conditioning is that like we would say that 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 process um, or we'd say it's a type of instrumental learning where, you know, you, in order to get rewards from the environment, you're changing your behavior. You're learning to run through the maze. So like Thorndike's cats, if you're familiar with that uh, experiment where, uh, well, one of the early studies of operant conditioning, uh, Thorndike created a number of puzzle boxes where he had uh, trained cats, placed them in a cat, uh, cats in a box that to get out, they would have to make some kind of random motion, like maybe trick or trip a lever or pull a string. And he put some fish outside of the puzzle box. 
And the animals would learn slowly, like if they, as they moved around the box, if they did something and the door opened, then on the next trial, they would do that action a little faster. And over time, they learned to escape the box quickly. He also uh, observed uh, that cats don't like to be stuffed up in a box. So he didn't even need the food, like just if they could get out, that was enough motivation. Yeah. So it's it's a very similar kind of learning, but, but what we think of as a habit uh, often relates to the development of kind of the, the smooth, automatic, fast execution of that behavior. But what looks like operant conditioning can also include what we would call goal-directed behavior, where an animal could be um, moving through the maze because they understand the layout of the environment, they understand where the food is, and they're developing an intentional plan to get there. Mm -hmm. So some of the work that I've done has been tried to focus or has tried to focus on teasing apart um, like what's when are animals using a goal directed behavior where in often we do this in a lever pressing uh, task. Are they pressing the lever because they want the food or are they pressing it out of what we think of as like a stimulus response habit? So it both would be. Yeah, and they both would be would look like operant conditioning, but often we're thinking of like we're interested in the difference between like a habitual automatic behavior versus our more intentional deliberative behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually have a lot of questions regarding that. So let, let's bookmark sure. that and yeah. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, so when you were in Minnesota, um, you, I imagine you, you said you started attending a Sangha there. So I imagine it was part of the category lineage. Yeah, so um, coming into to Minnesota, at that time you could find some information online and so I knew of the Minnesota Zen Center and then also found Dharma Field, which was started by Steve Hagen, who was mm -hmm. one of Category's students. And I didn't really have a strong reason to pick one or the other initially, but I had read um, uh, Hagen's book, Buddhism Plain and Simple, and what found it to be... It's probably the best introduction to Buddhism, like Buddhism 101 that I know of. I, I always recommend yeah. that to people. So especially like coming from having read a, a number of different sources, I found that very appealing. Um, and so started attending Dharma Field, I think in that first year of graduate school, um, and then continued there up through uh, when I finished my uh, PhD. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you work closely with the teacher there? Not really. Again, I'm I at the time still I was so uh, socially anxious in certain domains mm -hmm. that yeah, like I the, talking to um, Hagen was probably just stre too stressful. So, like when there were opportunities for like was it Dokusan or I I would like never <laughs> go in because it's like I just I didn't have any confidence that I that I had anything that I knew enough to have a question. Um, I think that is something in my life that has eased, but at that time it, it was, it was, I was too socially anxious. So, but no, I did, I took a number of classes there. Uh, took the lay precepts uh, with him, you know, went to a lot of talks. So I, I was involved in the community and really valued it, uh, really found it to be a really important place. Um, but I mean, I think that looking back, I can see where I could have been, you know, more, more engaged and advocating for myself. And that's not, not the right word, but more actively engaged in that part of it. Did you go to, uh, do you attend any of the, the, the session retreats while you're there? Yeah, it was hard on the, my graduate school schedule to do the longer ones, but, you know, I did a few of, they would, they had a nice range. And so there were several like one and two day options. Uh, and yeah, and again, I found those to be really uh, wonderful experiences. What's been your Zen practice like since then, since graduating? So yeah, so after graduating, I went and started a teaching job at my alma mater, Knox College in Illinois. And our first, uh, our oldest daughter was born that spring of, uh, or January of 2005. And we were at Knox for about a year and a half. And then I moved to Wabash in the fall, summer, fall of 06. And our second daughter was born in 07. And so honestly, most of my practice was just, again, going back to studying books on my own and mm -hmm. not really attending any communities. I was aware of Sanchin down in Bloomington. A couple of times I attended a Zen group that meets at a Unitarian church in Lafayette. 
Um, I think there's a Zen center in Indianapolis I attended once, but really had did not connect kind of more formally, uh, in part just because the schedule for being on the tenure track at a small college and the demands of having small children. Again, I just I, I saw it as a, a something I didn't have space for or time for. Mm -hmm. And I think more recently I've tried to reconnect because I think during the pandemic, I, I especially felt the absence of that connection. And then being able to connect with communities by Zoom, you know, again, reminded me of just how much, you know, it's it's shocking to kind of turn around and feel like, you know, I've been here at that time, like 13 or 14 years and had never gotten around to connecting with groups that, I mean, weren't terribly far away. Bloomington's about an hour, 40 minute drive. Um, it's, so It's tough yeah. when you have young kids. I mean, the, yes. the time in my life I it, I was least engaged with classical Zen training, you know, formal Zen training was when I had babies and toddlers and so forth. I mean, it's yes. just, it just sucks all your energy. You know, I mean, because every time you leave, you're, essentially punishing your spouse having to deal with all these kids you know it's, it's just right. hard to get away you know no and it did it did seem unfair to to put because i also have to travel you know a few times a year for work and so i'm already gone for conferences and um yeah so i yeah it did it did feel unfair so but now that my kids are in co not college yet almost but in high school it's a little easier to manage having one child that can drive is just a an amazing point in our our scheduling uh for some time yeah. but no coming out of the pandemic i really wanted to connect more formally even if just through zoom but i found that there uh was a group i wasn't aware of the great wind zendo in danville indiana that uh sits usually once a week and then does uh like a zazen kai on like one sunday per month and so I've been going to their um, events a little more often, uh, although this past fall, I, between my kids' sports schedules, I don't think I was there for a couple of months, but able to go back again once more in what, December. What uh, lineage is that? Um, also, yeah, connected to, to the Sanchins and Center, so out of the Okamura, Uchiyama uh, lineage um, and Hoko, Carnegas down there. So yeah, the... I really appreciated that community and uh, started attending uh, Sanchins and communities, virtual events, so sitting and their Sunday talks online, and then trying to, I guess I've only been there physically twice, once for a summer workshop and then once for a Sunday, um, like Zazen and, and lecture. But my hope is to be able to participate virtually with some regularity with you know um at least intermittent physical visits to the right. to the center and you, you just did rohatsu right no so we're there i'm going this week to oh it's this, oh, it's this upcoming week that's right yeah like yeah. leaving this afternoon they're doing a five-day sashin starting tonight that'll go through sunday so um it'll be the first time i've done one in person mm -hmm. uh since yeah, when we were in Minnesota. So it'll be a bit of a learning curve, but it's really easy. It'll be <laughs> nice and relaxing. Yeah. It's good. But I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, cool. So getting back to let's go back to the um, you know, kind of the the learning conditioning and um yeah. so what I've been kind of wrestling with lately, you know, I have the did you ever check out my website, Science of Zen? Yeah, no, I did. I did. It looked like there was a lot of um, kind of the focus on like the default mode network and like thinking of systems that uh, interact with it or are involved in kind of more intentional control. So right. yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. You know, anyway, so so that was kind of my first stab at the sciences and stuff. And, and since then, I've been doing a much deeper dive um, into the research, and which will hopefully culminate in a series of podcasts about that topic. Mm -hmm. Good. So anyway, and so what I'm wrestling with right now is, um, is uh, the relationship between conceptualization and you know different types of con conditioning. So for example, you know a person may go through life, you know, and and they come up, um, you know, you're familiar with Joko Back. So so she she would talk about the kind of the core beliefs that you have. 
you know, things like if I work hard, people will like me or, you know, if I, uh, or it's, it's worth, it's, there's no point working hard because things never work out for me. Or, you know, I'm, if I'm funny, people will like me, or, you know, if I submissive, my partner will stay with me, or if I'm dominant, my, you know, you, you know, people come up with these strategies of what they think, you know, you know, it comes, I think, kind of enmeshed into their kind of narrative sense of self, you know, their self identity, both in how they view themselves and how they view the world. And, you know, and a lot of our suffering comes from, you know, we, you know, we create these, you know, belief structures, these conceptualizations of reality that, you know, are kind of the filter with, through what our thinking and behavior goes through. And, and a lot of time, a lot of times that, you know, A, you know, the, the expectations we come from these conceptualizations are unattainable, so we suffer from that. And B, you know, a lot of times it leads to um, behavioral patterns that are not conducive to being, you know, not suffering and, you know, you create suffering for yourself and others. So, so with that context, what I've been interested in is, is how, you know, what is the, from a, both a behavioral and a neurobiological perspective, how, how do people come up with these conceptualizations, you know, you know, and, and, you know, and what, what are the neural correlates of this? For example, you know, if I believe that, you know, I need to be funny to be liked. And, and, and as an aside, it, it seems like a lot of these kind of core beliefs, you know, conceptualizations people come up with are, are often social in nature, it seems. Mm -hmm. you know, how do because, you know, it seems like a lot of our brain is built around, you know, the challenge of our, of existing as a human is navigating social dynamics and social hierarchies and so forth. And so it seems like a lot of these are, are built around you know, that context. So what's been a little bit of mystery for me and what, and what I'm about to dive into, and maybe you can, you know, offer me and our listeners a little bit of primer on it. And, and if, if this isn't your real house, feel free to just pass, you know, but, um, you know, I'm curious, you know, how do you go from, you know, we come up with these, we come to these beliefs one way or another through our learned experience, you know, they, they don't just pop in our head out of nowhere. So I'm curious, you know, are these conceptualizations, A, if you know what the, you know, kind of the uh, neural correlates of them are, I'd be curious to hear your, your take on it. But more importantly, how do you get from encountering situations, having some sort of learning process happen, and then how does that result in a conceptualization? So I, like, I assume that all these conceptualizations are part of um, explicit, um, What's the type of memory where you how the rules of the, you know, um, well, yeah, I think you mentioned in one of the emails like explicit memory or like semantic memory. Yeah, semantic memory. That's the word yeah. I'm looking for. Yeah. So like explicit semantic memory. So that's that's got to be where these assumptions about reality are living. And I'm kind of curious, how does how does encountering phenomena in the world and going through some sort of either operant or classical learning mechanism, how does that wind up being, you know, semantic memory that's stored in our brain? Like, do, do you have any, is there anything you, you'd want to talk to regarding yeah, that? Yeah, so some of what I'll say would probably be more speculative, but but yeah, so certainly like the, 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 the idea that, you know, maybe even just at a cognitive level, like mm -hmm. that we have certain, I mean, we have a lot of concepts we use to make sense of like our experience mm -hmm. that um, like when we look around, you know, we we don't experience like the raw sensory input. Like mm -hmm. we we experience like our like projected expectation of like what's the world around us. So and then it happens physically, um, you know, even the, like if you look at your own hand right the that sense there's i mean i think for many people there's a natural feeling of ownership that feels like it's there but but in fact that is that is creative actively and we can show that by looking at people for whom that sense of ownership has been disrupted but also just even through simple demonstrations um a classic one is the rubber hand illusion where mm -hmm. if you put a, a fake mannequin arm on the table and yours is below the table if someone like strokes the mannequin arm and your arm in about the same relative location, about the same times, a large number of people will feel this kind of weird sensation that they know it's 
it's not a real hand, but it feels like it's theirs. And so our, our brain is constantly trying to make its best guess about, you know, what's out in the world, what's the difference between myself and the rest of the world. And, and I think you're right that that extends into social domains as well, that a lot of our uh, cognitive work is really spent trying to understand social situations, to make predictions. Um, and, and if I think of these core beliefs, I mean, I think of these are cases where, I mean, it might not be classical conditioning exactly, but a person has experienced a number of situations and then what we're ab abstracting, like the rules we're detecting are, are ones that like might be that they believe that the world is unfair or that, you know, the, the worst is always going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that often when we try to, to challenge those, we'll use some, like on, on the psychology side, we'll use some uh, behavioral techniques, classical conditioning. If you're familiar with systematic desensitization. Yeah. Can, can I, can I inter interrupt real quick? Yeah. It just dawned on me that um, a lot of people listening won't necessarily know the difference between classical and operant conditioning. Could you spend like 30 seconds? Oh, sure. Um, so, yeah. So describing the, um, contrasting the two. Yeah. So operant conditioning has to do with how does behavior change depending on the consequences of that behavior. So um, if there's, you know, this is the idea, like if um, you are, oh, I mean, I guess we often study it in rats, but if you put a rat into a box where a lever will produce food, that if a rat spends enough time in there, if they randomly brush up against the lever and a pellet pops out, that over time, they'll detect that correlation between the, the event and the food delivery, and then they'll shape their behavior to get more of that reward. Um, or uh, speaking back of young children, if you've ever used or known people to use timeout as a punishment, that uh, if uh, an individual finds if they engage in a behavior and then that moves them into a situation where they're kind of deprived of things that they want, like opportunities to play and move around, then they can change their behavior to kind of avoid that punishment. So yeah, opera conditioning is really kind of focused on, on two general rules that um, actions that tend to produce a better state of affairs will become more probable and actions that tend to produce a worse state of affairs will become less probable. And that's, and that's kind of the core driving factor. Classical conditioning has more to do with like detecting, like making predictions, like, like detecting events that tell you something important is going to happen. And mm -hmm. then trying to then release usually uh, what we think of as kind of an automatic unlearned um, uh, reaction. So again, animal models, this is often studied with fear conditioning. So if um, a light or tone is presented and then an animal receives a, sh a weak electrical shock, just something mildly aversive, um, the shock usually would cause an animal to kind of startle and run around a little bit. Uh, but as they learn that association, what you'll find is the animal, like when the light or the tone comes on, will become very still, won't move, call that freezing behavior, heart rate, uh, blood pressure will increase, stress hormones. And what's happening is that the animal has learned that association. And for the rat, like if there's a, a risk, like a physical risk that's in the future, like the kinds of tools they have to prepare for it, one of them is to freeze. Because usually in the wild, they're not avoiding weak electrical shocks, they're, they're avoiding predators. And so if you detect a dangerous stimulus, becoming still is a good response because that could protect you from being seen. It doesn't work in this case. Mm -hmm. um, the same, we'll, we'll notice this in our own lives. You know, I, I don't ever speed on like an interstate, you know, more than like five miles an hour. But if I come up to a point where I see a police officer watching traffic, like I will have a very strong, like sympathetic nervous system response. My heart starts pounding, my blood pressure increases. It feels like everything becomes very, my attention really narrows to focus on that. Um, all of those would be uh, reactions that are, are similar, a type of fear that comes from a stimulus that I've learned could be aversive. 
So, and you don't even have to, for humans and some animals, you can learn that kind of conditioned response um, even without experiencing it directly, just seeing uh, examples is enough for us to develop those kinds of fears. Or if you think of children with deep fears of spiders, very few have had a bad interaction with a spider, but they may have seen their caregivers uh, react with fear. And so uh, that's a very contagious one for, for humans, especially. So yeah, classical conditioning is about learning that an event you can't stop is going to happen. So what are the appropriate uh, protective or preparatory responses you can take? And mm -hmm. operant conditioning, like what can you do to, to try to improve your position, to get what you want and avoid what you don't want? Okay. All right. So with that context, let, let's, let, let's, let's create a scenario here. So let's say there's a, a young woman, she's, you know, 16 years old in, in, in high school and she says something funny in class and everyone laughs, you know, and so she's learning something there like, oh, like people liked it when I was funny. Yeah. And then the next week she, she's hanging out at the mall with her friends and she says something funny and everyone laughs and she gets, you know, so, so, you know, and so slowly she's, she's developing this belief system, you know, this conceptualization that if she's funny, it's going to improve her social situation. So that would be a strong case yeah, where operant conditioning is going to be one of the, the levers or the, the mechanisms that's going to keep encouraging that movement. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so, so from, a, okay. So, so, so it's an operant condition. And, and so I guess the, the tie this into Zen, all right, let's say, so in that case, you know, it's, let's say she takes it too far and she starts being funny in situations that are not socially applicable. I mean, maybe she's at her grandmother's funeral and tries telling jokes and it's just awkward, or, you know, maybe she's, you know, annoying people at work or, you know, you know, like kind of later down the life. So, so let's say, so, so we're, let's talk about where the mindfulness would interact with us. So in what way does being more aware of your internal cognitive state and, and emotional states, what, in what way would mindfulness increase awareness of this condition, you know, this operant conditioned conceptual view of reality? And like, and how do you unwind that, you know, fr from a, you know, from a, you know, I think we all know experientially, you know, anyone who's done a lot of sitting knows that you're just, you know, the more you're aware of your thoughts and your emotional reactions to things, you know, the less automatic behaviors are. And in the, and, and you just, you don't, you don't automatically start doing things out of your, based on your learned conceptualizations, you know, you're a little more likely to be able to control um, what's going on, you know, and thus, you know, you just kind of create less problems for yourself and others. And so the, so what I'm trying to narrow in on here is like, what, what is the kind of the neurobiological underpinnings of all this? Like, how are you, how, what, what do you see as mindfulness being the point where, you know, you're kind of breaking that circuit, you know, do you have, a, I know that's not totally in your wheelhouse. So you, again, you can pass on this, but I'm curious. Oh, no, no. I, I, there. That's one that I've given a lot of thought to. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think that like, what I, what I really think people should understand is that classical conditioning, operant conditioning, like they're shaping our behavior all of the time. Like those, those are systems in the brain that are, are very valuable to us. Um, to, to be able to develop a habit is, is actually a very valuable part of our, um, of our abilities because it allows us to kind of uh, develop plans that we can execute smoothly without a lot of oversight. Um, but if you just let them run on their own, you can end up in cases where your behavior may be shifting in ways that other systems, other parts of ourselves might not find to be optimal. So the example uh, with um, being rewarded for saying something funny and maybe going too far, right? That could be a good example. So no, I think that what's important is to say that um, the mindfulness or, or bringing awareness to these processes should be helpful on average in kind of being more conscious of these patterns. 
so that we could make choices about how we want to behave and respond in the future that can actually end up shaping some of those hab habitual ways of responding. So, I mean, I don't think I'll ever be able to, to behave entirely like without using any automated behavior. I think that, that is, that's deeply part of us. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, I think it's problematic when that automatic behavior allows me to, to separate, to, and I think Joko had written a lot about the gap between like experience and, and, mm -hmm. and an awareness. Um, so that, um, like that we are, if it's allowing me to separate and really just ruminate or daydream and, and really disconnect with reality, then I think that is problematic. And also a situation where I may fall into habits that are easy or habitual types of responses that are easy, but which are not, um, the ones that I, I really, that meet my aspirations. And so I think that, that mindfulness is really important in kind of uh, pruning back or shaping some of these uh, responses. And honestly, a lot of the approaches, the more cognitive approaches in psychology share some similarity, trying to, 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 to bring these assumptions about the world. You were thinking more cognitive ones, I think originally these core beliefs, bringing mm -hmm. them out into the light and saying like, do these really make sense, right? You, you've reached this conclusion, but is there really any evidence for it? So challenging some of those, the foundations of those assumptions is an important part of a lot of cognitive therapies. Mm -hmm. And I think mindfulness can be helpful in that same sense. So, um, and especially if I've fallen into an automatic behavior that is pulling me away from like actually experiencing what's going on, then it can be helpful to kind of come back more quickly um, and then hopefully then have more agency over how, how I'm going to respond in the moment. I'm curious. Um, so, you know, let's, so, so let's say this hypothetical young lady, you know, she's a Zen practitioner and, you know, and her, her powers of kind of walking around Samadhi have increased and, and she's just kind of more aware of what's going on cognitively and emotionally in her life and her body. And she's realizing, and she just realizes like, oh, I'm inappropriately funny sometimes. And so do you think, what what is the mechanism, do you think, uh, unwinding that is? Do you think it's some sort of extinction? Uh, or do you think uh, it's more like a new operant conditioning rule that's overruling the old one? You know, what, or, or is it both? Does that, does that question make sense? I mean, honestly, I think it could be a range of things. And so mm -hmm. I think that, in in that case, it could be that you're going to try to find some space to kind of commit to noticing these situations and like trying to choose a different response. Or I think looking closely at the like the rewards that are supporting that behavior. Mm -hmm. And by really looking at them closely, you might actually be able to shift like how you're responding to the laughter in that sense. So, so, I mean, I think another kind of important lesson, you know, is that like, there's really no, there's really nothing that, you know, is rewarding or punishing in itself mm -hmm. objectively, but it, it's how we respond to it. That's, that's key. So mm -hmm. some, sometimes we see this just even if, um, I guess like th there are times when biologically that can be shifted in ways that are problematic, but cognitively we can, we have some ability to, to, I think by giving attention to how we're responding, you know, to question like, is this really something that I enjoy mm -hmm. and instead of, of going along with it. And I think that that can shape some of the reaction too. So maybe it's like a, as we're talking about this, it, it made me think of Judson, Judson Brewer's work. Are you familiar with him? Judson Brewer? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, so I'm realizing this now talking about it is, um, you know, so his kind of thesis is with this kind of unlearning bad habits is, I think from his perspective, it's a new operant conditioning process kind of overruling the other one. So maybe, you know, he works a lot with addiction which maybe is more of a classical conditioning thing, but he, his theory is that 
you know, you, you've learned this kind of rule, this, you know, value reward behavior kind of cycle. But what you're doing is by paying attention, you, you're seeing that the, the anticipated reward is not there that you expected. And in fact, that there's other rewards. So, so his theory is, I think, is less of an extinction type of dynamic and more of a, a learning a new rule, basically. What? Well, and even even in extinction. So in extinction, this is kind of like uh, a case where, like, if you've learned that, I guess for humans, like when we used to use uh, vending machines, you know, if we put mm -hmm. our money in and we press the button, like we'll get the thing we want out. Um, if the machine is out or broken, you know, we'll press the button and, and we won't get the the food we expect. So we might keep trying for a while, but eventually we'll stop. Same mm -hmm. with animals. If you have a lever that delivers food, rats, if you turn off the food, they'll keep pressing lever for a while, but eventually they stop. But it's not so much that, and that we call that process extinction, but mm -hmm. it's not so much that they have forgotten it or they've erased it, but they've learned a new rule. It's probably the best way to describe it. And usually it's, for what we'd say for in our human experience, it's something like the lever's not working right now or the soda machine's not working right now. So we don't think that every soda machine is broken or that this one always will be broken. Like we'll come back and try it again later. Um, so, so yeah, even in extinction, we're usually learning like a modification to the original rule. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I think when we think about addiction, there are certainly components that are classical conditioning. So uh, drugs, can certainly serve as powerful rewards and actually affect how we affect our learning in, in processes in important ways. But certainly opera conditioning is, is very important as well. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think probably the, the profitable approaches to addiction are gonna acknowledge that it's probably not one thing, but rather that uh, there are multiple ways that, um, so this is my advisor, Dave Reddish has kind of pushed this or has been part of our group kind of pushing these types of, of approaches to say that, you know, when we're making a decision, we have multiple systems in the brain that can, can let us take the same action. Mm -hmm. uh, each has strengths and weaknesses. And so you can end up in, in a state that we call addiction through vulnerabilities in different decision-making systems. And so then eventually we'll probably be able to help a person think through like what's supporting it in your case and then identify more tailored uh, interventions. So Dave Reddish, he's uh he's the author of the mind within the brain, right? Yeah. I, have you read that one? I'm in the process of it. Yeah. I mean, I it, in fact, it. I was reading that book that kind of made me start thinking about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I would highly recommend it. Um, cool. I mean, and I, I think it's an approach that has been uh, very useful um, in my own work. I, I would, I've used it with my summer research students for years that, that text. Mm -hmm. Um he has a new book out in December, Changing How We Choose, that's about the trying to know, to establish a, a science of morality. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think and it's I think it's very interesting. It connects back to how or to the mind within the brain, but I'm about halfway through that one now. Oh, cool. Um, so I know you you kind of have a hard stop here because you need to get going for your retreat. Yeah, like yeah. So yeah, if we could wrap up by like was it 9:38 your time? Yes. By 10 or a little okay. after. Yeah, so um so I, I had that specific question just because it was on my mind, but I I'd, I'd also like maybe step back and let you drive it a little bit. Like what 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 are the basis or not the basis? Like what what are the areas in which you are personally interested in the the intersections between science and zen? You know, I I'd, yeah. I'd like to hear, you know, what what's what's kind of a burning interest for you in that area? So, so yeah, if I think back to like what really motivated me to get into Zen more deeply, I think it was a sense of not having a spiritual faith mm -hmm. and having a lot of, I guess we'd call it like existential dread. About like, what does it like mean to be alive? And, and, and I think combining that with like an approach that treated, you know, reality from a more materialistic perspective and and just wondering like what's the point of conscious existence in that that world like just left me with a lot of yeah existential anxiety or dread mm -hmm. uh, and so I found Zen very appealing in trying to to uh, provide a, a spiritual framework that I found resonated 
um, and and one that I thought was at least uh, not at odds with what I was learning about how the world worked. Um, I think today, if I had to say like what's valuable to me now, um, I think that I see science as just one of many ways that we can try to make sense of like the orderliness of our experiences that that it works very well to assume there is some kind of reality that exists that that is is something we can learn something about through kind of third party observations mm -hmm. um that follows lawful or follows natural laws i think that's been very powerful but uh what i've really appreciated about zen is the um is an approach that I mean, approaches that don't try to to give you direct access to what that reality is, but tries to to maybe acknowledge that it is always going to be inaccessible. But also, whatever conceptual framework we use, whether it's science or uh, another type of conceptual framework, like those are just tools. Like in the end, like we have to let go of those tools. They can be helpful, and maybe individually they might be helpful in our practice, but in the end, like the brain is just another concept that that we use to make sense of the world. I've never seen my own brain. Like I've even in an MRI that sets a very mediated type of information. Um, so but I, I think it's it makes sense to to act as if it's there and it and it's um, part of what's producing this experience. Mm -hmm. But but it's helped me really try to appreciate ideas like that, you know, the self is the entire is everything like there's no you know small self inside of a external world that like everything we experience is the mind like there's the truth of that makes more sense to me now than it did 20 years ago uh, as a, a high school and college student yeah it makes me think of uh have you read that book the case against reality i uh, we just i just picked up a copy and yeah, so it's i think it's the kind of thing that, uh, yeah, that I have been thinking about more. So, but I do think like the 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 challenge sometimes is to help people avoid uh, nihilistic interpretations of that, mm -hmm. and 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 that's just I think a very subtle and delicate point that um, like <laughs> that the value judgments we make about any of these um, ways that the world could operate. Is itself is itself something that's produced by the mind? Like there's no val like the things like we assign value to things. Like it doesn't exist except like even in the sciences. Like it existed because um, animals such as ourselves needed to do that in order to survive. If we didn't assign value to things, it's hard to just to sort through what possible actions one should take in the world. But but once they're there, it can seem like it, it really exists. And it's like, no, not really. Like even in science, it's it's a fabrication. Right. Um, so I think that that's been important for me. So I see science as a an important, valuable framework for kind of understanding the orderliness of our experiences, but one and one that can be helpful in my practice, but that in the end, like I still have to let go of it because it it is just a, a tool. It's not itself real in some fundamental sense right you know and about the um uh you know the you know the the potential of like dropping the denialism you yeah. know, experientially what i found is you know I, when i first encountered buddhism you know the idea of like not being a self seemed kind of nihil nihilistic to me and but having practiced for a while, you know, uh, you know, the, the kind of the opposite seems to um, come up where, you know, instead of, you know, like, well, there's no self, none of this is real, you know, what's the point, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of the opposite where, you know, life becomes richer and more vibrant and just things are just kind of groovy no matter what. But, and, and I, I always thought that was an interesting I don't know, I guess dichotomy is the right word. And and some research that I've read that kind of explains that, which is interesting, is, you know, I I think you could characterize all that, you know, appreciating the richness of life, you know, in a direct way, you know, as awe. You know, and, and, and I've run across a, a number of our um, papers where they've found that, you know, awe is 
anti-correlated with default mode network mm. activity. And, and, and I think, you know, in the default mode network for people who don't know is, is kind of the part of the brain that, um, thinks about the self in terms of past and future and constantly running simulations of what might happen and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, is the source of a lot of our, um, our unhappiness and dukkha in life. And, and I just, I really interested how it, that seemed to kind of ex explain mechanistically the experiential experience of like the less you're thinking about yourself and the less you're kind of trapped by those types of thoughts, how, you know, life, instead of being nihilistic, and you, you, you just, life itself just becomes, you know, so rich and vibrant, you know, I, I, I really, I really thought that 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 spoke to me a lot, you know, kind of seeing that. And, and, and this would be an example of what of why I really love discovering the parallels between science and um, and um, and Buddhism, like because it, it really so much of the what could be experienced is validated by the research, especially the last five years, I think, because they've kind of really, you know, like like five years ago, I, I couldn't have made that science of Zen website. I mean, that oh, the research yes. just wasn't there. You know, it's just, it's really the last couple of years, the research has just been amazing. Yeah, no, and, and I think this is a, a a really exciting time to be involved in, especially on the cognitive neuroscience side. Like there's just a lot of interesting work going on. Um, and, and I think our understanding of how, uh, especially at a computational level, the, mm -hmm. the brain's activity allows us to have, to make decisions to make judgments and to support these experiences is going to be a lot more clear you know even five years from now mm -hmm. um so one last thing i want to hit on before we go is on your sure. website you have an article on um you know i think i wrote this down here is um, how does rebirth fit with what we know about the brain you know and and, and i thought that was interesting maybe we could close on that because because in a lot of ways yeah on some sense you know, the, the diving, you know, the exploration of science and Buddhism is kind of a secular type phenomenon. You know, a lot of people would characterize that as, as, you know, a secular lens into Buddhism. And in one of the biggest differentiation, I think, between people, and I don't necessarily consider myself a secular Buddhist. I, I don't even think about it, really. you know, I just, you know, but, um, but, you know, kind of the dividing line between secular Buddhism and kind of more what you could maybe call traditional Buddhism is, you know, is, you know, rebirth and transmigration and karma and so forth. And, and so I, I thought that was an interesting um, thing. So I, I would like to hear maybe a little bit about if you can remember what you explored in that article, if you could talk a little bit about. Yeah, and I think that, that relationship to the brain. Yeah, and that article was inspired by, I think, an, um, a chapter uh, from a recent book, and I forget the author, but it was in, uh, I think, Buddha Dharma magazine, uh, like an excerpt, uh, looking at at rebirth um, and how Buddhist faith has understood it. And um, and I think that the part of the reason I was attracted to the American Zen tradition was that there weren't a lot of requirements to accept Kind of more magical types of of events so that uh the idea that you know the buddha you know took what 10 steps in the 10 directions after birth and and spoke like didn't have to be taken as a literal statement of like what i would have seen if i were standing there at the time um at least at least in the 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 teachers who i had had focused on so the the idea of rebirth in the sense that, you know, specific parts of our um, memories, and subconsciousness experiences could carry on into the life of someone else, some other person who would exist in the future. Um, you'll see a number of people who who try to make kind of try to carve out space where that could happen, like some some mechanism. And I would say that you know, based on my understanding of science, it's just, it's very unlikely that, um, like, um, my whole childhood has already been erased, you know, pretty much from my own uh, memory. I'm not sure what could survive past my own uh, mm -hmm. physical death. So, 
yeah, I don't, I think that um, I, I was, I'm cautious about people who would endorse science, but then try to carve out some kind of exception. Mm -hmm. So I find it more interesting when people try to maybe undercut the belief in like a, an external reality, uh, physical reality. But I think if you take that out, then it's not really scientific. You're saying we need a different conceptual way of understanding reality um, that's not really going to work with the assumptions of science. So, um, but I think that I, I've been really, I guess the the approaches that kind of focus on the idea that we don't really exist as a stable entity, you know, the belief that I am a person now who existed when we started this talk or, mm -hmm. you know, back in the 1990s is, is a useful convenience. Um, I, I certainly don't think that that relation was going to hold past my like physical death, mm -hmm. but I also don't know that it's like super, I don't know that it's that important to me anymore, like to worry about that part of it. And so I think You're agnostic about it, maybe. Well, but I, it's not so much, not even agnostic. I mean, I, I feel pretty comfortable. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I think that like the part of practice that tries to look at like the, the idea that I separate myself off as a, a single person existing in the world is a, a convenient, um, a convenient fiction. Mm -hmm. And so the, and, and so I liked your description of the default network and, you know, thinking about planning about the future, those are critical things for us to exist as social creatures, to function independent of, but just because they're useful doesn't mean they're, they're right. And so I think that's important about practice is to try to say, try to kind of loosen some of the grip of that approach. And so the, yeah, so then in that sense, like it doesn't bother me as much because I don't identify like my, with a, like my small kind of limited con convenient self that, that that's not the core of yeah, how I would identify. So yeah, yeah, I think in the rebirth, I don't know exactly the direction I took with it. I think I was mainly trying to point out places where people were trying to carve out some kinds of exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think like in the end, I don't know if I use the reference there, but uh, I was reading a book, is it Catherine Hayhoe's Saving Us about how we deal with climate change. And she was talking to someone who really you know, vigorously was angrily upset with her presentation on climate change. And then she got upset, you know, fighting with them over the science. And then she talked with this person about how they lived and they lived like a, a low carbon lifestyle, very environmentally sensitive, like all the things that she would want. And they just didn't accept the science of climate change. And she's like, well, it kind of doesn't matter what you believe. <laughs> right. right? Like what you do matters. And so, and so and I, I think in that sense, like, again, if I treat science as one useful way of making sense of the orderliness of reality, there are other systems. Mm -hmm. um, probably not all of them are perfect or even adaptive. But like, if you have a way of understanding how the world works that leads you to, to living a life that, you know, supports the, um, the benefit of all beings, then... I mean, I don't, doesn't, that doesn't matter to me if you don't believe in, you know, quantum physics or. Um... Right. Yeah. It, it, one thing I always think about when kind of comparing like the kind of mechanistic materialist view of life and practice and more traditional view is, you know, the, the, the very idea of consciousness itself. Ah, uh, yes. And, and the fact is scientists, don't have a clue where you know oh and, and by consciousness i mean it's it's kind of a nebulous word so i'm i'm, I'm very sp specifically talking about awareness of awareness you know the capacity of of what it's like to be something you know um and so you know I, i've read everything i could find that's accessible to a lay person you know like the and even like the more sophisticated stuff, like um, um, you know, like um, 
integrated information theory and so forth. You know, that's, I can barely wrap my mind around. And, but all of those theories, they seem to be more measures of consciousness as opposed to explanations of consciousness. And, and I just find it interesting how, you know, and I mean, there's really like kind of three options. One option is the brain creates awareness of awareness. You know, it's, it, there's some sort of neural correlate that's not just correlation, but also causation. Another option is that, um, um, maybe there's more two options. Yeah, and the other option is that, you know, consciousness, you know, awareness of awareness is something that is not limited to the brain. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a feature of the universe. You know, there, you know, you could, you know, there's the panpsychism, you know, type theories where, you know, consciousness is just a fundamental, um, thing, you know, and, and some, a lot of times I just kind of intuitive, and this could just be, you know, whatever, but I, I kind of always feel like sometimes I wonder if like awareness or consciousness is just one of the properties of the universe. Like for example, the brain uses, so electromagnetic energy is a force in the universe. It just exists whether there's a person there or not to, to, to perceive it. You know, electromagnetic energy is just, it's an objectively true, you know, force, you know, electricity, you know, you know, um, in and of itself, uh, gra you know, the weak and strong, you know, gravitational, uh, um, um, uh, um, um, atomic forces, you know, those are all kind of forces that exist that the brain kind of can make use of in a structuring, you know, and I, sometimes I wonder like if maybe the brain is not creating consciousness, it's just one of the properties of the universe that the brain's able to harness, you know, because like a brain exists when an organism needs to move and make decisions, you know, that like, like there's that one organism that, you know, has a brain as it's floating around, but as soon as it sticks on the rock, it literally consumes its brain because it doesn't have to move anymore. Maybe. It doesn't need a brain. Right. Yeah. And, and so, so maybe organisms that need to move around and decide part of what, you know, you know, being able to decide kind of, you need something to punish with good and bad feelings. And if you, you know, without that organism being aware that it's being punished, like, does that punishment even exist? You know, so, I, you know, like, so I'm, and so I'm kind of, so I'm kind of curious, like maybe, you know, awareness is, is just, it's a property of the universe. And it's just one of the many resources the brain makes use of in its functioning. Well, and again, like the idea that there's a material world out there is is itself just speculation, right? Mm. It works pretty well, but right. um, I think it was Borges, the the author, who had a, an essay. I think he called it a new refutation of time, and he he talked about how David Hume's idealistic approach, the idea that everything is the mind and it's you know God kind of holds it fixed, mm -hmm. that was ridiculed by scientists. Uh, but I think uh, Borges's, you know, response was that, you know, Hume had something right. The mind is what we experience. And it was the scientists who had this kind of unnatural duplication of the world that they had to create the physical world to explain it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be a, the case that eventually to have a satisfying theory, you, we have to posit something like that, that awareness is a basic property. It could be. I still think that even in that area, we'll see some things improve. But that that part, like that question, was one thing I really loved about the like Seth's book, uh, especially the very beginning of the first few chapters of Being You, uh, where he did talk about integration, integrated information theory, because um, because there is something awe inspiring or or beautiful about the idea, like well, if there was a reality that operate according to physical laws that didn't have consciousness in it, like after the Big Bang and as things are settling, like assuming that was even the beginning of it all, right? Which is a weird, probably not. But still, if you took that, like in the universe, if there was no consciousness, the idea that at some point matter could, you know, through a process of evolution, arrange itself in a way to have a brain and to have consciousness, to think like in that non-conscious universe that consciousness could come into existence like what's kind of awe-inspiring and beautiful, like if that were true, right? Yeah. And if so, then it's like, well, what other kinds of things could just, could be created that don't exist or we don't know exist now? Or so maybe no, I think there's, 
humility, I think, is always a, a key part of, of science and, and our practice to say, uh, what was it Suwaki Roshi had said that you can't share so much as a fart with another person and that yeah. that there is a, a gap that um, that we can talk, but we can't really share those things in, in the way we experience them. So no, I, I think that that part's going to always be unsatisfying. If we come up with a good scientific theory, we might have to posit something like, like awareness is a basic property of the universe, just to make everything work out. But mm -hmm. I still think at some level, like if that doesn't lead to other testable predictions, at some level, we're still going to be unsatisfied, you know? Right. Yeah. But if we're ever completely satisfied, we probably should interrogate that, that, um, and to make sure it's not complacency, right? That there's... Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's important, I think, to differentiate between you know what is necessary towards liberation, yeah, and, and really the the truth is you don't have to understand the underlying mechanisms. I mean, like don't know mind is actually the operative dynamic, you know, towards yeah. liberation, but it's still interesting, I think, as a person to to think about this stuff, you know. No, and I think yeah, that's that's I think very important is to say like what parts of this are useful for your practice, right? And and for how we live, and and a lot of it is probably not, even even the things that are really valuable discoveries that might improve human health might still not be super relevant like to to practice. So no, I think that that is key, and um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I want, I want to be respectful for your time. I know you got to get ready for your retreat. So let, let's uh, maybe wind up here. Could you let people know um, what your website URL is or other ways they could get in touch with you? If, if Yeah, if it's just a neural Buddhist, all one word dot com. Um, and that has, I think if you go into the about me, it has links to my like page at Wabash. That link's not an easy one to share, but if you're interested in seeing other research stuff, if you go into the the about me page, there's a link to my Wabash page. Also, mm -hmm. if you just uh, Google, you know, Neil Schmitzer Torbert with a hyphen in the middle at Wabash, it'll come up um, as the main one. So, okay, great. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time. Really well, appreciate you it. Too. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Yeah, let's keep in touch. Yeah. All right.